spoken with HFC Bank and Sethi Realty. as to how relatively Ghana has developed uh, as far as the area of industry is. We know that post-independent sector or post-independence era, uh, the government of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah tried to set up a lot more of the industries that we have today, a lot more of the sectoral uh, factories that have ensured that we've been able to, well, relatively in some small ways, then the raw materials we export in large quantities into some finished goods. But have we done better nearly six decades after independence? And we're just bringing to you a preview as we mark independence uh, anniversary on 6th March 2016. Do we think we could have done better? If you want to join us for this very conversation, please make sure that you log on to our Facebook page, join us on TV for which uh, we've had a link of that very page to our Twitter handle at Join on TV. And also, make sure you watch us live as we're streaming on our YouTube channel, Major Online. You also want to give us a lot more of your perspective on WhatsApp, 0560 is a number for that very platform. And then straight away, let's uh, hit your screens with um, our conversation. And I have to introduce my guest. I have um, with us the Minister of State of the Presidency in charge of uh, the PPPs of the private sector. And Dr. Rashid Purple is here with us. Thanks for joining me. And uh, as I always say, for an election year, I have to introduce his constituency because he's a member of parliament. One Central is his constituency. And thanks for joining me. I love your white. Will you be going to the mocks this afternoon? Of course, yes. Great, 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 great. <laughs> and also um, joining us is uh, a director in charge of investor services at the GIPC. Uh, and Evelyn Yako is my guest. Thanks for joining me. How are you two? I'm fine. Great. We're going to have a great conversation. Principal. Principal? Yes. Uh, civil servants. They always want to make sure they put things in order. Always being politically correct. Mm -hmm. Is that not it? Yes. And uh, uh, somebody who has uh, been in charge of making sure he hears all the complaints and also serving as a liaison between the industry and also uh, policy formulators, policy implementers, the public, etc. He's a chief executive for AGI. And AGI, we're talking about the Association of Ghana Industry, and Set Aquabwa is here. He's not related to the musician, though, so don't worry. But somebody who has seen it all, uh, started with Unilever, has been a consultant, uh, is, has been served many boards, have even served as a member of Presidential Economic Advisory Councils, etc., is Ishmo Yamsen. Fortunately, uh, he is currently a founding uh, partner with uh, Yamsen and Associates. And you could remember we've interviewed uh, his son, Michael, a couple of times on the show as well. So great perspective we're, we're having here. But let me ask you, um, Minister, from your perspective, and since you're in government, we'll ask you, if we have to do an assessment of how we have done since independence, what would you say summarily as far as industry is? Well, um well, good morning to your viewers, our viewers. Uh, essentially, you would break it down into three streams. First of all, the situation where the conception and the thinking of government at the time was that it was, it was time and it was good for government to be the center of policy and to drive the private sector. And to be the private sector mover itself in other words, there was no thought about strengthening the private sector there because at the time of independence, we didn't have enough capacity to go into business and do business. And Krumah thought it wise to make the state to take the lead. So all the big industries were established by the state itself. So that was the thinking. Then the second phase or the second stream was when, um, after the coup d'etat, the thinking was that let's strengthen, let's develop a private sector, let's dismantle state enterprises and see what we can do about the private sector. And so we started seeing an emergence of um, a private sector. And then the um, structural adjustment years, when essentially we were our hands were twisted, the World Bank said, look, these are not working, sell your enterprises, make sure there's a strong private sector. Looking back, 
I think that we, we needn't have all these stages at all. If we decided from the word go that the private sector is the answer to many of the challenges we are facing, is key to the economy, let's make sure we strengthen our individual Ghanaians to go into the private sector and make it big and give the economy an image where we can be independent of external um, buyers and sellers and imports and then export more, develop our economy, change the structure, make it less primary, um, an economy. If we had started right from the beginning, it, it would have been better. So we didn't do very well mm. in terms of developing a private sector, but we have achieved something since we decided that we're going private, we're liberalizing our economy and we're supposed to give power to the private sector. We've, we've done some, we've gotten somewhere and we can improve it. Mm. Well, relatively, we'll come to the issue about how we can also bridge the gap between the private and public sector, but also making sure we insulate the, the, the private sector from all the, uh, the exigencies or the shocks that uh, come out of poor implementation of policies, really targeting them. Now, Evelyn, um, from just a normal directory department, now regulated, uh, fully autonomy, uh, GIPC has been in a position to always make sure that uh, you are the bridge between us and those who would want to invest. Um, would you say um, over the last 10 to 15 years, from all the things that we've seen from the time of independence, etc., the last two, 10 to 15 years have been the period when we've seen a lot more investment, but have that uh, been uh, dovetailed into the whole agenda of making sure we have industry, an industrial base of our country? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, like you said before, I'm Principal Investment um, Promotion Officer with the Investor Services Division of the GIPC. And the GIPC is uh, the main government agency mandated to promote um, foreign direct investment into the country. Um, the initial notion for GIPC was that we were dealing with only foreigners. But currently, we have enrolled in all Ghanaian companies as well. And um, our current act, the GIPC Act 2013, Act 865, um, spelled out that all Ghanaians who intend to enjoy incentives with the GIPC can register with the center. Now, when it comes to industrialization, GIPC's role has always been um, on the priority areas set by government. And when you look at manufacturing, which is um, a major part of industrialization, manufacturing has been um, among the top when we come to priority areas for the nation. And over time, manufacturing has been growing, though it's a bit um, on and off. Um, but um, with our current law, which gives manufacturing companies the opportunity to come in and set up without and fulfilling the minimum equity requirements, we have seen some significant improvements in um, companies that come in to register as manufacturing. Um, there were a few challenges for a greater part of 2015, but um, we are hoping that with the stabilization of um, the power supply and other um, economic indicators, um, this sector would grow as we move along. Mm. From all that she's saying, uh, Seth, I, I get the inclination that we're, well, we have not really, as a nation, make, made sure that we continue from what the initial agenda has been post-independence era. Because we've had truncation. The minister has talked about uh, all the things, uh, all the things that we've had, the various economic programs we've had with the Britain Wood institutions, how they failed us, and how the private sector, which now we think should be at the centre, um, is not having the connect. Is there any disconnect at all? Yes. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting us. Yes, you're right. Um, I think we've had a checkered history of, of industrialisation in the country. As Honorable Minister said, at the beginning of the industrialization process, state was actually in control. Most of the big establishments or corporate uh, institutions were, were, were owned by the state. Private sector was also, right from the onset, was part of the whole uh, arrangement because individual enterprises, especially the SMEs, could set up their own businesses you know, to uh, produce various things. And I think the expectation was that with time, private sector would fully take over. At some point in time, I think that 
you could see that the, the re-expectation on the private sector uh, taking full control and moving the industrialization forward has not been fully achieved because in so many respects we've had a number of challenges and therefore the growth that we expect mm. we are not seeing it. Um, one key objective of, of the manufacturing uh, sector being made to grow was to create employment and today if you see the employment that is being created in the manufacturing sector it's not that much. Meanwhile it has the best of potential to create so many jobs. So there's a bit of the intentions are good, the programs are good, but we've had challenges in implementing effectively some of the programs we put in place to make sure that the objectives that we've set for ourselves are, are being achieved. So uh, I wouldn't say there's a complete disconnect. There is a collaboration, there's an arrangement, but the impact of the policies are not fully felt. And I think that is where we need to look at to make sure that we really get the right impact so that the private sector will take uh, the right center. And it's good that you ended on the subject of policy because my question for you, definitely, <coughs> you started working way back in the 60s and up to now, uh, you still are contributing your quota. Uh, interacting with the industry, interacting with the various players uh, within the various sectoral areas we have in our economy. Would you say from the initial intention that, well, uh, whether they are socialist inclined or not, of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and for all the upheavals we've had and trying to have a certain trajectory, the policies as they have been intentioned have, one, been well formulated and well implemented. And if the, during the implementation processes, have we evaluated adequately and, and seen that, well, these are the things that we needed to do and so as a way forward, we we'll, would have a better perspective. Well, thank you, Evans. Um, I think I'm lucky because uh, I have seen virtually every government since independence. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and probably worked with most of them. For me, our, our, our current situation saddens my heart a lot. Because if I look back to 1966, when I came out of university with a lot of hope, uh, I look at Ghana then, even with all the difficulties that the country faced at the time, and today, and the journey that we have traveled, uh, it's, it's quite a worrying situation. I think two things stand out. First, policy inconsistency. Right from 1966 to today, what has underlined the performance of industry, and I mean manufacturing, services, you know, the extractive sector, mining and whatever, is policy inconsistent. And linked to that is uncertainty. Industry, whether it is in the private sector or the public sector, is allergic to uncertainty. And yet there's so much uncertainty in our history that makes everybody sit and, and question whether really uh, uh, we, 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 we can make it. Because if you look at the policy direction, if you move from one era to another, I mean up to 66, from 66 to 84, when we went through a whole lot of uh, uh, political instability, and on the average, about 20, every 22 months, we change government in this mm. country over that period. <laughs> so the, the, there has been no clarity of direction in what we want to do as a country. When, when in 1984, we launched the economic recovery program followed by the structural adjustment program, the whole idea was that by the time the program was over, Ghana would be in a situation to take off again. By 1990, it was quite clear that we were going nowhere. We were going wayward? We were going nowhere. And indeed, we were going wayward. So the World Bank and the Ghana government uh, commissioned a study, Ghana towards a dynamic investment strategy. And at the time, 26 key issues were identified as hindering the progress of industry. As we sit here today, if you read that document, you will think about, you, 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 you would 
think that you are reading about Ghana today. And this was 1990. And all the issues that were identified, apart from political stability, every one of them still exists as we sit here. So Evans, for me, I think what we need is a clear direction of where we want to go with the industry. What we need is then ruthless policy implementation mm. and a commitment that that policy should succeed and is very fundamental. Unless we do that, um, and I can tell you that in the last three, four years, we lost a lot of companies. Many companies have just shut down uh, because we knew as a country, we knew five years, six years, seven years, eight years back that we, we were running into a huge energy gap. So why do we have to wait and panic and, and just sit and watch industries collapse before we act? So for me, it's, it's about a country that requires a clear direction of what it wants to, where she wants to go, a commitment to that direction, a commitment to ruthless implementation. You see, when we are building a plan, things will come up. But at least the path must be there. You should follow it. And so long as we don't do that, I think we will continue to have problems. I mean, I've heard the GRPC and everything. Let me give you one example. If you, look, if you read, and, and I can tell you that it was a major issue for me. If you read the GRPC law today, it says, if you want to come and manufacture in Ghana, you should show that you have brought $500,000 into this country, either by cash or in kind. Which Ghanaian is going to show $500,000 to set up a factory? So you're saying that it's inhibitive? Completely. Discriminatory against the local? Indirectly, yes. If because they, supposing I, they want to partner a foreigner, for example. Well, yes. The partner needs to bring $500,000 or jointly. They have to, but my, I question the fact that why should we say, show us that you have brought the money into the country before we give you a license or before we allow you to operate? And, and I think that that's why I talk about policy clarity. If we want, we want to industrialize, then we need to ask very basic questions. What must we do? What should be done? We look at it from the point of view of the investor and in the point of view of the country. And there must always be a harmony between the two. I always used to be to say when I was CEO of Unilever, I said, look, every time there is a, a disconnect between my government, my country, and my business, then I, I know there's something wrong. Mm. Because every time the two must be aligned. You see? So that's for me is the is at the core of the issue. Do we really know the direction we want to go? And if so, do we are we really committed to it? In all aspects, in all aspects. Dr. Popo, we have many plans, we have many laws, but the, the whole argument about having a national strategy or a national plan and its absence, how does that um, perhaps also uh, inhibit us from going into a certain direction? I'm asking this because you, you may be a politician, but you're also experienced in your area of, um, of study and experience and professionalism, etc. As you sit there as a minister, you look at how you have to deal with the private sector. Um, do you think, just like somebody may have felt in government 10 years ago or perhaps even 20, 30 years ago, that whatever it is that my department or my ministry or my portfolio is starting, there could be a continuum. 20, 30 years down the line. And so you see and you look at it and you see, you think that, well, perhaps it may end when my political party or my government goes because of the lack of direction or a plan as a, as, as, as a country. Well, thank you very much. Um, before I make that, I will request the GIPC person, when it comes to her turn, to clarify the investment process that um, is required by law. You know, it's, it's meant, I oversee GIPC as Minister of State, so um, there is a, a well streamlined investment process, Ghanaians and external investors, and 
and the law streamlines it and it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't discriminate against Ghanaians. And, uh, but the question you are asking also is a question about the economy. For me, the private sector is very crucial. The economy is about the private sector. And if you can have a strong working private sector, you can have a very strong, resilient economy. And so policy about it must be very definite, very clear, so people can know and be able to predict exactly what is happening. So I agree with um, Mr. Yamsen in these, in these um, areas of analysis, and that there must be a very well-defined policy trend so that previous governments can understand exactly what it is, that the citizens of Ghana can insist that this is what should be done. If you go to the United States today, which is a model of democracy and private sector, and then you decide that you, you, will, um, you will nationalize any, pro, any, any of their industries, you'll be creating chaos. If you go there and you decide that you slap a certain modicum of tax on a certain product so that it doesn't, it's not produced in the United States or something like that, that touches on the viability of the private sector, you will get a problem because it is the economy. Just imagine what um, Obama did in response to the sagging United States economy. He tackled the housing industry. He stimulated the, he, he got a stimulus package for the private sector. And before long, employment was increasing, the economy was back on track and things were working. So we cannot differentiate between what the economy is and what the private sector is. They are very intertwined. So policy about them must also be very definite and would have to be understood by previous governments so that we don't seem to feel that because party A was in power and ran these policies, we are in power, we won't run that policy and it will still be okay. And we must have a very conscious citizen, you know, a very conscious civil society that will put government on its toes and that would be very conscious about the fact that the economy must be up and doing, you know. So I think that we are in, on track. What the president has just started doing is to focus on the private sector and then to say that there must be a minister in charge of it and it must be at his presidency. So a critique about the private sector, government policy about the private sector will come directly to the presidency so we can tackle it headlong. It is something, it might not be a perfect system, but it is a way by which we can isolate the private sector as an issue and deal with it. I, I do agree that um, the challenges that we identified in the 90s, and we, 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 we thought about addressing them haven't been very successful, partly due to our inability to respond to our own policy initiatives as a government in all, across all governments, you know. In our history. In our history. We, 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 policy must, policy and policy response must be very clear, you know, and there must be outcomes and results which you can measure against the, the reality. Well, very interesting point. I know you want to come in though, but before uh, Mr. Chumakwawa comes in, I was reading a book about three days ago by Professor Jeffrey Sykes, yeah. and he wrote it around the period of the credit crunch uh, crisis, and it's titled The Price of Civilization. And he went on uh, and made references to how small businesses um, in, uh, in quantum about 22% uh, being the, the genesis for which America is what it is today and for which America for the time that they had the credit cri crisis um, was able to stand on those small businesses as SMEs and lift itself up because the big ones were in trouble. Sure. And then government was, of course had to come with a bailout and things. That gave me a perspective that as far as capitalism is and all the things that we say about how capitalism is important, government is critical and what they can offer the various sectoral areas is, is important. Do you think, for all the things that we see, the big factories for which now we say they're closing down uh, and then the small 
uh, um, medium-sized industries that we need to have. How do we rope them in when it comes to a certain policy direction? Because if the top is suffering, I, I presume that then even the smaller ones uh, uh, will be suffering just like the grass. No, if I say, um, Roland. Roland, sorry. <laughs> I, 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 let me come back to the, 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 the issue about policy. The economy of Taiwan, if you, if you read about the, the, the four East Asian tigers, mm -hmm. Taiwan is unique. But Taiwan's economy is based on SMEs. It's not based on huge American companies like South Korea and, and Singapore and, and the rest of it. And they took a, a clear decision that they were going to build an economy driven by SMEs. But the SMEs linked, that's what we call the push-pull, linked to big companies either in the States or whatever. So, if Boeing uh, wants to make spare parts, you will have a small factory in Taiwan manufacturing that, that spare part to the specification of Boeing. But that is possible because the government makes a clear, clear policy that they will support that SME mm. to bring up that quality and that standard to Boeing. So it's, it's, about, it's about clarity of purpose and clarity. You see, and I like what the minister said, but let me extend a, a bit more. Our politics is a, is, 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 a is, a, is a disincentive. Because our politics is not a national politics. It's not about country, love for country. It's about love for party and love for self. And I'm not being critical of anybody, because it's, it's cut across all political parties. The American will tell you it's love for country. In Ghana, if parliamentarians are voting, it's about my party before my country. So if we all decide that, look, 80% of our economy, maybe 80% plus is SMEs, they are critical to our success. So whether it is party A or party B or party C, what do we think as a country that we have to do for this sector, for them to have the capacity to lead the growth of the economy? So. It, 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 it brings me back to the discussion about where do we really want to take the, this country, how do we want to do it, and, and what commitment do we bring to it. Let me, let me tell you, in America, we hear about tax breaks, don't we? We do. Tax breaks. Yet the fund comes here and says, I'm sorry, but you are not collecting enough taxes. So when we are formulating the tax program, do we ever think that we need to give tax breaks to our SMEs for them to, to, to ensure that in that critical period, they have the capacity to survive and to help the country to grow? We don't. So, and, 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 it's, and, and let me add another issue. I think Ghana and most African countries are always confused. We had we, we had a program of water for all, health for all, eh, by year 2000, by the UN. Every country had a program to follow. At 2000, there was no mention of even how the world has performed. Then we had the Millennium Development Goals. And you go from country to country. Every minister stands up and talks about Millennium Millennium Development Goals. How that is linked to their own, own peculiar circumstance, nobody knows. But the, the, the donors will give you money if you demonstrate that you are pursuing Millennium Development Goals. How that is linked to your national policy direction, nobody knows. We have come to the end of the Millennium Development Goals. We have performed woefully, not only Ghana, everywhere. So we introduced another Ten Commandments, Sustainable yeah. Development Goals. And therefore, why governments are even writing their own national strategic agenda, they have to make sure that it responds to this. And, and I think that that confusion must end. We as a country need to define what we believe we can do. Of course, if we do those things well, all those issues will be answered by our own policy direction.
Mr. Chuma Kwaba, and I'll be bringing you in soon. But at what point do you tend to differentiate that when you are interacting with those who are supposed to be the policy formulators and implementers, and of course, they could be the normal civil servant or the public servant, and then also uh, the political appointment holders, you don't tend to confuse that with it being part of the process of policy implementation and sustainability. I'm, I'm talking about the present time. When we know that we're facing great difficulty, your mem members come to us as media, they complain to us, uh, they don't have electricity, the too much taxes on their product and etc. And so you will ha have to be uh, what you have to do by also advocating etc. Yes, I think that when it comes to the policy side, um, I think largely, largely, we, we, we tend to agree on, on similar policies. The major problem we've had in this country is effective implementation of the very policies that we have agreed and we have also developed. Uh, I think that if you look at you know the manifestos of most of the political parties, they all sometimes you know uh, talk about similar things. They are not completely different in terms of objectives and all that. Employment creation, uh, industrial development, macroeconomic stability, every one of them will talk about it. So you're saying the but preambles are there? The preambles are there, but when it comes to the actual implementation, that's where you have a problem. In fact, a typical example is the industrial policy that was launched in 2011. The starting point was actually even in the MPP regime. They actually started, of course, I mean, they had been way back, some, some before, before, but in recent times, at some point, we were complaining that there was no clear industrial policy to guide our industrial development in the country. So somewhere 2007, 2008, effort was made to start the preparation of industrial policy. And then MPP as a power, NDC came, and they actually took it. And indeed involved all the stakeholders continuously until the policy actually came out. Well prepared document, and I remember at the very early stage, there was a TV program with myself, Madam Hanatete, and Honorable Ajuma Menu from MPP side, and we were all talking about the same thing that indeed the policy has been well developed, it has involved all the political parties, involved all the stakeholders, a well-written document. So it means that in terms of policy consistency, it is there. The question is, how well have we been able to implement it? And that is where, for me, the biggest challenge is. And, and here, it's not just the, at the political level, but also at the operational and institutional level. At the, you're asking uh, whether there is no confusion between at civil service level and then the political level. I think we've had challenges at all at all these levels. How do we ensure that we've agreed that we'll implement this policy to help industrial development? How do we ensure that it comes into pass? The energy issue uh, Mr. Yamshin talked about, it's all part of the industrial policy. There's, there was clear plan to make sure that there's energy uh, sufficiency uh, in consistent and uh, reliable manner. What are we seeing today? If we sat down and it's, we, we, we're having these challenges, um, go and see uh, part of the key part of the document also is the macroeconomic stability because private sector thrives on stability. As uh, Mr. Yamsin said, there should be certainty in the macroeconomic environment. If I'm planning that I'm investing this much, I must have a time horizon for recovering my investment. If I'm borrowing any money, I must have a clear plan that uh, by a certain date I will be able to recover my investment, I'll be able to take uh, pay up my facilities or loans and then expand further. But here you are, your city is depreciating, uh, sometimes it fluctuates, it goes back and forth. So these uncertainties do not help. Macroeconomic stability was key part of the industrial policy. So again, have we failed or not? We have not been able to effectively implement the very policies that we have, we have, we have put uh, up ourselves. And I think that's so, where the challenge is. So at the GIPC level, how then do you make sure that um, you tend to also uh, migrate or if not, uh, tend to do the proper assimilation of the local investment portfolios with the foreign ones that tend to come in? We know what you have to do with the foreigners. You, you tend to give them all the necessary assistance and the breaks in taxes and, 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 and all the things that they need. Uh, how do you do that, that assimilation? Okay, um, before I go to that, I wanted to clarify something that was said by my former chairman um, concerning thresholds for investments. Um, the previous law, which was Act 478, had a threshold for all foreign investors, no matter the sector. But the current law, which is Act 865, has 
exempted some sectors from the minimum equity requirement. So even though the company will be wholly foreign or a joint venture company, they, will, they are not required to meet the minimum equity requirement. And these sectors are manufacturing, export trading, and um, export trading and portfolio investment. Um, this one can be seen from Section 29 of our GIPC Act 865. You can go and check. There are exemptions for some sectors, and manufacturing is one of it. So when you are coming in, we don't ask you to bring in that minimum equity requirement. You, you can register and then start business just because we want to encourage more manufacturing into the industry. And then also when it comes to Ghanaian companies, um, like I said before, because the, the notion was I was for foreign, since um, 2007, there was the direction that we should encourage more local investors to also thrive in business. So what we did was all those incentives that were given to foreign companies was extended to all Ghanaian companies who want to enjoy it. And if you want to enjoy it, you only have to register with GIP and you assess them. So like for instance, the exemptions that um, exemptions from duty on machineries that in, uh, foreign investors are able to assess, Ghanaian businesses also have that opportunity to um, assess that incentive. And currently, all incentives that are there for foreign companies are also there for Ghanaian investors and they are all enjoying it and um, one thing we have initiated is um, the regional sensitization tour and every year we go around all the regions to encourage Ghanaian businesses to understand the activities of GIPC so they can also benefit from what the foreign investors are also getting. And for it's exactly 18 minutes after 8. Very interesting conversation uh, ongoing at the head office of the HFC Bank. My colleague Roland Walker and his guests. And we're getting some WhatsApp messages on that conversation. Mr. Yamsen uh, is speaking the truth. Our politics is indeed disincentive to our economic growth. Kindly include your name when you send me a WhatsApp message. Uh, we're also asking a question uh, on uh, this month of Ghana, uh, how far we've come, the best and the worst in the history of Ghana. Prince Amwatin Kaboni writes from Ofori Chrome, after 59 years of independence, the citizens still complain of hardships, but our leaders keep enriching themselves with our own money. Some building huge mansions elsewhere uh, outside Ghana. Doomso is still alive, and the most irritating Ghana uh, and the IMF, poor Ghana, a change is coming. That's your thoughts on this. Uh, this one says, in the lifetime, okay, uh, it's quite long. Oof. Okay, I don't know where I can even take it from. Uh, family settings, there are three dispensations of power. And you go on to name it, but it's pretty long. I can't obviously share everything. This one says, I don't know the people who have been deceiving the president to also be deceiving Ghanaians. The president made mention of ongoing works on Brekum to Sampa and Winchi to Sampa roads. Meanwhile, work on these roads stopped about eight years now. And there's no contractor here. No wonder uh, the, ja the Jamai Nok district with Sampa as its capital and the biggest border town in Ghana recorded the highest number of cases of the pneumococcal meningitis outbreak due to the dusty nature of the district. That's from Pula in Sampa, sending us that WhatsApp message. This one says, uh, Dear Roland, good morning. My name is Diamond Roland. The situation we find ourselves is a pitiful one because the current leaders are more of theoretical leaders than practical leaders. Secondly, you say, we have made political interests bigger than national interests. Uh, this kind of thinking, West African nation cannot move forward. Uh, time has come. We need to stand against this wicked and self-centered leaders. God help Ghana and West Africa. These are some of your thoughts on WhatsApp on uh, 0560800000. Uh, and on the earlier exercises that we did, Mamavi, you're good. This aerobics just that uh, some of your moves were like Agbaja. And that's from Paul. You know, for I say, I've got like a big challenge in this area. And I think that I'm challenged this morning to take it up and work on it. But thanks for the message. Uh, since independence, uh, Ghana has only worse political leaders who are selfish and never 
uh, satisfied with anything. And that's from KKB in Aflao, sending us his thoughts on the best Wests uh, in the history of our country. This one says, um, those disregarding our 59th independence celebration must rethink. After all, we have achieved, uh, after all we have achieved, and since our independence becomes a history is what celebrated. Okay. And on that note, uh, we have to join Roland Walker, uh, who is right now still speaking to his guests. It's uh, an interesting conversation. We'll go back and keep your messages coming through. All right, whilst we work on that feed to get you back uh, to join Roland Walker and his guests. We're taking the conversation to Facebook now. We've got uh, some of your comments on Facebook. Ghana Mant, tell us the best and worst thing about Ghana. Uh, hashtag Ghana Mant, hashtag AM Show. So here we go, lots of your comments. Uh, this is from Paul. Paul Bright says, best thing in Ghana is our food. The worst, um, the debts. We need to change this. And hey, it's a beautiful country. I love Ghana. I love your message, Paul Bright. Samiato says the best thing is Ghana is blessed with 59 years and still growing. The worst thing is this government cannot stop uh, Ghana to achieve its aim. Okay, uh, Noble. Noble, uh, nobleman Kojo Dawson says the best thing about Ghana is we have fine brains. The worst thing about Ghana is these fine brains are underutilized. Wealthy Evans says best thing is I'm a Ghanaian. Worst thing is the government. Solomon Kusi says the best thing about Ghana is we don't do lots of microwave meals. So cancer isn't really a problem here. The worst are a lot, you see. Overly religious, which clouds our thinking, hypocrisy, too dirty, and scandals from governments kill patriotism. That's your opinion, Solomon Kusi. I love it, by the way. Merriman says the best thing about Ghana is our food, and we're lovely people. The worst is corruption and bad economy with debts. Nana Kwame Osei says the beautiful thing about Ghana is the religious tolerance we have here. Uh, there is a place called Takwa. Uh, now, Boso, where a mosque is situated exactly where a church is, and the co the cohabitate peacefully. Okay, uh, where Wache Sela is a Muslim and sells to Christians and Muslims alike, where my Muslim friends attend my wedding in the church and I attend theirs, uh, where a family I know, the husband is a Muslim and the wife is a Christian. This is a country. Uh, though despite our tribe differences when it comes to love, an ever girl can marry an Ashanti man. That's beautiful. And it's only in Ghana. The only natural disaster we have is bad governments and poor leadership. I can't believe it. That's a natural disaster, huh? Prince Nuruddin Baumia says, the best thing about Ghana is its peaceful coexistence, the rule of law, and the fundamental human rights. Kudos for that. But the worst things about Ghana is its corruption index, industries collapsing, imposing high taxes and bad roads, especially the Bolga Boko Road. May Dante Nate says, best is Mahama. When the lights go out, the first thing that comes in mind, funny stuff, worse, Mahama, boring all the time. IMF crazy stuff. Balfour Asari Okoto Frippon says, the best thing is the unity in Ghana. The worst thing is we're trying to use religion to set differences between us and using more Western and Arabic names instead of our native names. I wish we all be proud to use our native and local names to keep our history instead of the foreign names all, uh, all in the name of religion. Samuel Kaya Jay uh, has also got his say on Facebook. 
It's a shame being Ghanaian nowadays in our own land where Fulani's threatening and kill us. Shameful. Uh, and as Joy News on TV, you can log on to Facebook now. Francis Anochi says the best thing about Ghana is our cowardice uh, and fear for change. That has been the backbone of our peaceful coexistence. The worst thing here is about how the educated and elites in society promote ignorance and make nonsense of the knowledge gained through education. Uh, Solomon Akologo also says on Facebook, the good thing is that we are privileged to be blessed by God to have a country like Ghana. But the unfortunate thing is that some people are so indisciplined uh, whose behavior whose behavior have a negative impact in the country. There's respect to the elderly in the name of politics on social media, careless driving that sent so many people to, the, to their early graves. Some people now value properties than human beings, etc. These are some of your opinions, some of the things that you are saying, commenting on, on Facebook. Uh, I've got more messages on WhatsApp, but what we'll do now is to link up right back with Roland Walker, who is at the head office of the HFC Bank. Uh, I, I raise about what the other countries are doing, doing better that we're not doing. Quite frankly, I think, and, and the uh, AGI uh, uh, CEO just mentioned, I think businesses want certainty and businesses want policy direction what else do they want we have a good environment politically and, and exactly you economically know, they know, can come in and invest you know, they have the gipc you know, and the other president leman asked this question that ghana has done everything and yet the investors are not coming and that's that was that was why i referred to this 30 1990. at the macro level you have made a policy but you go to the micro level there are huge problems huge problems and I give, and, and, and I give, I always give this example of a, a, a small, medium uh, a, a company in Tema that had to invest in its own road to its factory, buy poles to draw power to its factory, dig the ground and connect water to its factory. In other countries, you take this for granted. You are there. You just walk in. You pay, and within but seven. But it's a developing country. How? But, how, the, but how, I'm how, referring to developing how, countries. How do we? How do we not have a complementary, perhaps, uh, or symbiotic uh, provision of resources by both the investor and also no, but, the, the government in place listen, before that is done? Listen, if you go back from 1967 to today, and you look at how much money this country has has spent on infrastructure either from our own resources or from monies we borrowed or from monies that the donors have given us. And what you can show on the ground, on the ground is, 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 is a pitying sight. So if we cannot use our resources to, to generate or to provide those facilities to the, to the, I'm not talking about private sector because industry is both private and 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 government and and let us disabuse our minds. When we talk about industry, we are not saying that it is equal to private sector. But without government, there will be no private sector. There will be no private. There is nowhere in the world that I have seen private sector drive an economy without government backing. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that we must provide the basic things that you know investors want: predictable macroeconomic uh, environment efficient and competitive infrastructure, well-trained, well-trained human capital. And I can tell you that we, we, we boast of trained human capital. But you go from factory to factory and ask them if you were to employ a fresh graduate from any of our universities over any tertiary education, whether, how long it will take you to bring them up to speed. I'm not saying that there are no good people, but we are not spending money to, to deliver the, the kind and the quality of human resource that industry wants. Mm -hmm. So we need to, and these are very basic, we are not talking about rocket science, we are talking about very, very basic things that every investor would want to see. Look, why? Cote d'Ivoire was at war for almost how many years? And yet, ten years. And how many, why is it that investors are going to Cote d'Ivoire? Why? Only ten years after the end of the war. 
we have been independent, but we have been, we have been peaceful for how many years? And instead of attracting, we are losing. It means that there's something that we are not doing right. And I'm saying, let us make sure that it doesn't matter who is in power. There are certain things we cannot take for granted. We cannot take for granted just every eight years we destroy our economy and then we have to spend three, four years to rebuild it. By which time we are ready to destroy it again. I mean, it, it's not on. Mm. I, I wanted to come to you because do, do, do you share in all the things that he said, for example, for your, your members who perhaps are local investors or even if they are partnerships, etc., do they also have difficulties in getting access to certain infrastructure before they even come to the base of their core business activity? Yes, they do. And I indeed share very much what uh, uh, Mr. Ismael has said. Uh, if you go to Tema today, uh, Tema is supposed to be the industrial hub and we make so much money from them by way of taxes. Go and see the roads in the industrial area of Tema. Ideally, what should have been the, the, the scenario there? We should have been seeing good roads from, Very let's say, good roads Vakor runabout into... Exactly. You take the road that leads to Tropical Cable, Railroad, and all the industries from, I mean, from the Tema still area. It's terrible. We just we had a meeting there about two weeks ago, and the industries around the enclave came together and said, what can we do? Can we even have an arrangement with government that we probably can even do it and then we are giving tax concessions and tax, uh, you know, because it's terribly bad. Meanwhile, we are constructing roads elsewhere. So if indeed we see industry as that important and we see it as an area to make money in terms of tax and create the jobs, why don't you pay a bit of attention? Most of the industrial areas, the facilities are not that good. So it's a challenge. And then the issue that uh, Honorable mentioned, concerning the fact that we also need private sector who are committed, who are honest, who contribute, who are integrity. I share with him perfectly well. Indeed, AG, we've had concerns. Our members have had concerns over some private sector operators who undermine the very, their own colleagues in terms of uh, development and growth. It is there. For example, uh, under invoicing. I will tell you the way under invoicing is killing industries in this country. I visited a, a, a mosquito coil producer recently. The guy was a typical trader who was buying large volumes. Then he decided that you go into manufacturing. He sent five people to Malaysia to be trained in this area. He set up the factory, invested so much money. At some point, he was employing more than 200 people. I visited him last December, and they were left with 14. And the 14 are just people cleaning around and, and, and doing you know, basic administrative work clearly tells you that it is virtually closed. He took me to his warehouse and he has volumes of mosquito coil there not being sold. And the reason was simple, because people are bringing in mosquito coils and they're declaring the volumes and under invoicing the value. And he was telling me... The prices are good enough for the market. Exactly. He, I mean, he said he, he, the last import he did was around 2006. And then he set up his factory in 2006-2007. The value he was paying was about $7 per a, a certain box. Today, it takes at least $20 to, to produce that kind of box. Meanwhile, people were declaring $3. We took them to Tariff Advisory Board, and they are indeed discussing this. They immediately, the customers came in and they said they are going to increase. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to acknowledge the fact that there is serious and they're invoicing, and these are all private sector operators. But the question is, you ask the very relevant questions. How has other countries done it? Here, I think we have weak institutions to police all these uh, 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 corrupt people. We should have very strong institutions to police them. This is a typical duty of the customs. How can somebody bring in goods and then dec and then declare the value? And all these things that you say are killing businesses. Yes, are killing businesses. All right. So, so uh, there are so many. So I mm. think that government has a role to play through these institutions, and the institutions should be strong enough. All right. Today, Ghana Standards Authority are supposed to be monitoring the goods that come yeah. into the country and the goods that are being produced. And the most of the monitoring is more on the local producers. You still have imports that are not meeting local even local standards. What are we doing? And they are flooding our markets, coming in cheaply, and they can't even, the local companies cannot compete. So it's, it's, it's a difficult situation, and we need to look at it from all these angles.
Well, it's a special edition of the AM Show and we're coming to you from the main head office of HFC here at Ridge in Accra. And uh, as, as always, HFC, they come with a lot of the products for you. And um, you know that uh, no matter how much you have, it's never enough. And well, people, because you always need more interest on your savings and more free charges on your bank transaction. What if there was a place where, well, their own suits or savings accounts can earn you more interest rates, where ATM transactions and other bank charges cost you nothing? At HFC, uh, they just do that, that. They offer you more interest rates on your savings account, and this is even up to over 15%. Zero charges on HFC ATM transactions, zero service charges on specific accounts, and they do anything to make sure they put a smile on your face. And so welcome to HFC Bank. You have to make sure you sign up to the following packages. And they gave me a couple of uh, their flyers here. You can see uh, we have the HFC Susu Plus account, okay? And then they also have the HFC 55 Plus account. And they also have the HFC Premium uh, Savers account. Uh, there's one that is not here though. It is the I Do account. And for all of you who are customers of HFC, you can even use uh, the, uh, this very location in which you are, plain greenery for you to have your event receptions, your weddings, etc. Just as part of the uh, uh, exceptional uh, events and also services they have for you once you are in a position to, uh, to become the best customer of HFC. And so please make sure you join HFC Bank. But now let's come to a perspective, Minister. Uh, uh, okay, before you, which areas usually come in most? Uh, I've read your last three reports. Uh, would you say that the investments have come in as a a FDIs, etc.? Yeah, um, currently the, the, the sector, that is usually more every oh, yeah. quarter, is services. The services sector is always um, higher when it comes to investment. But um, um, looking at 2015, um, manufacturing has also followed services. So that as services is leading, manufacturing follows up with it. But before, it was manufacturing then trading before uh, no it was services trading before manufacturing comes in trading retailing retailing yeah but now it has um it has moved to um services then to manufacturing so we are hoping that if all these foundations that are supposed to encourage industrialization are put in place for instance power um, um labor um, and transportation in terms of roads like what he was saying and then even um, 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 logistics when it comes to shipping and the time it takes in clearing goods and all that if all these structures are stabilized then we we, we are sure that yeah, um, yeah, PC, all the things that you, you're talking about do you think they're just textbook stuff or you think they could be realized they could be realized if all right. we all get committed <laughs> to it now uh, let's come to the, the, the area uh, of agriculture and how we can use that to become the main strength of our industrial sector because you go to many countries it's the most incentivized sector but it is the 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 fulcrum around which industrialization is set up and we're not talking about uh, different countries you go to northern africa southern africa they are there you never get to see any plantations um, the numbers just don't do as good for example, we're told, uh, how much is it? Is it the percentage 1.004% uh, as far as growth is concerned? <laughs> kind of sends shivers down the spine of many people. Dr. Rashid Yeah, um, thank you very much. You see, agriculture, as we all agree, is very fundamental to our economy, especially an economy where you have good land, arable land, and you can have good labor, a lot of labor, overflowing, you know, you, you, you cannot do without agriculture. In fact, it must be a base for our takeoff. Because if you want rubber, which is used a lot in cars, in aeroplanes, in everything, it's in agriculture. If you want garments, it's in agriculture. If you want food to eat, it's in agriculture. If you want to cocoa to export, it's in agriculture. Everything that will make a nation great comes from the agriculture base and for me I have a problem with our Ghanaian mentality and our investor confidence you know 
we, it's not time to start work and to dialogue with government all the time. Business must be dynamic and business and government relation must be dynamic. We should be talking all the time. You know, there are things that will hurt business that they will wait until it is too bad, then they complain. There are things that they can easily pin government down. You don't wait for government to come. You pin government down, come for meetings, request them, make it public, and let it be part of our commitments, and we will do them. You want them to come to you, and you not go to them? There is two ways. We go to them when we need it, when we need something done. They should come to us when they need something done. We, we, we have to start work. So in agriculture, most of the investment you are talking about, we are seeing in this country, are people who want to buy from outside and come, commercial. You know, lots of them are commercial. The manufacturer is good. We have a very good manufacturing base. AGI, I've looked at their, their membership, is growing and is doing well. But it's not enough. We need to expand. We need to in, infuse technology and drive in, in, in the things we do. I know government has a role to play, but they need to come and talk to government. It's very important. You know, so we know exactly what we want. We need to have people who want to move into agriculture from the base of um, production and agriculture into manufacture, into export. And we should have people in all these areas of investment. Mm. And, and it is crucial for us. And, and they must. And then those who they, develop the interest too. Yeah, the, yeah. Base, the base must be domestic before we have external investors coming in. But everybody is thinking about can't we extract, can't we attract somebody who will come into our, our land? We have a lot of land, we want a foreign investor. We can have Ghanaian investors do that. UT Bank, for example, can decide to diversify. It's a very serious domestic bank. They are very committed people. I've seen that one of the few. Um, initiatives that are shown that has shown class and distinction they can decide to diversify into agriculture and we can see what they can do if they send the same kind of seriousness into agriculture things can change you know they can we can have lots of other businesses in Ghana instead of just buying from outside we can produce in Ghana. The shopping malls we are have rising. Some kind of uh, Procter and Gamble, uh, Gabo, lots or some of shopping of the malls, Paribas from Brazil, etc. With chain of businesses, yes. is that what you mean? Yes, the shopping malls mm. are using a lot of products, and it is shame. It's a shame yeah. that we can have such businessmen in Ghana, and they can bring vegetables, fruits, into the country to sell. It's good that you mentioned the shopping malls. I take my kids to the malls that we have around. Uh, sometimes I even have to because now the, geographically we're all already circled. And you go there, there's chicken from Brazil. There's one that uh, my, my, my household tend to like a lot. Uh, is this uh, Sahara or Seraphim or which one is from? And, and you get to see, uh, don't we have local chicken that can fill the shops that will make sure that at the end of the day, we are able to meet the needs of customers? Don't we have the structures in place that will enable an investor and he's mentioning UT for example knowing that if I do the projections and I've gone to take money and I amortize how the payment should be over a period I know I can do uh, enough business to recoup my investments. Roland let, let me tell you that uh, agriculture yeah <laughs> um, and let me just paraphrase uh, Chairman Mao agriculture is not a tea party it's serious business it's a top serious business not a tea party at all I, I, I have had something to do with a plantation. Indeed, I was a project manager for Ben Sawyer Power Plantation as a young boy. Uh, and I've seen this plantation up to today. Uh, and I've seen the progress they have made. I can tell you that there is not a shortage of interest into agriculture either by foreign investors or by local investors. Then what's, what's the there problem? is no shortage. The problem is that the conditions are bad. Just bad conditions. And I'll give you an example. Bensu Oya Pabri was established in 1975. To today we sit here, the road to Bensu is not tarred. So, so you're saying that who should have tarred it? But government, because they pay their, they pay their duties, they pay their, all their taxes, they pay 
they, and, and one of the incentives was that if you locate where well outside the this capital you, you have incentives. Yeah, but there are other but you see, don't forget that it. if you give me uh, 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 a 10-year tax incentive, it makes no sense because I have to make the profit before I enjoy the incentive. If the, if the conditions for me to make the profit don't exist, it's meaningless, totally meaningless. Now, if you then locate a factory, uh, uh, plantation, and I can tell you, I will repeat it, that there's no shortage at all. There are many investors, both Ghanaian and foreigners, who want to invest in agriculture today. As we sit here, and I'm sure the minister probably knows that, there's a huge uh, rice processing factory somewhere in the north, and another factory to pack vegetables. The factories have been built with the hope that they will do a backward integration and everything was put together. And yet, they just can't find the rice and they cannot find the... Uh, and so ask me, why is it that you encourage somebody to build a factory, but you won't encourage somebody to produce the raw material? All right? Because when we built, when you labor built the, the, the thermal plant, that was the motivation to go and build an oil palm plantation. So it is backward integrated. And then you process, and then you have a local market. And therefore, again, I come back to policy. And, we, and unfortunately for us, we also uh, spread ourselves too thin. Malaysia, many years ago, took a decision to build an economy behind palm oil, oil palm. The Malaysia today has over 5 million hectares of land under oil palm agriculture. We have 18,000. Well, let the government start it. The next no, one no, comes no, no. and... Yeah, but the government... The next one comes and says, I'm not interested. Yeah, that's the point. The policy consistency. So, apart from a champion's time, where he made agriculture a real focus, and that was the time that the Bensu was, was established, no power was... And all these... And you are saying, well, the policy direction was great. Was the environment great. was... Exactly. The commitment was... Exactly. Okay. So, and today as we sit here, and there's something that really broke my heart. In the current, in the current tax uh, uh, regime, tree crop farming, and listen to me, tree crop farming, attracts 1% tax per annum, tree crop. Tree crop takes a minimum of five years to make money. In the five years while that the company makes no money, there's 1% tax to pay from where? To go and borrow money from the bank to go and to pay government. So it's the integration of policy. We need money, yes. But with the money that we need, is it structured in a way that will attract people into agriculture? Because if you want to drive agriculture, we must make it attractive to those who want to put their money in there. Mm -hmm. Look, I don't know if you have been to Pinora. Pinora is in Asamankesi. I don't know any of you have been there. It's a fabulous place. And it was built uh, in an area of citrus, orange, uh, uh, pineapples, uh, name them. And they have great difficulty, even sourcing the raw material. But there's a, there's a fantastic factory built in there. Are we not interested as a, as a country when a private person has committed itself that we too join the private person to make sure that, okay, our agriculture department will give the extension services to all these farmers. We will give them the good roads so they can cut their produce. So we put up a, 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 a program to make sure that that factory is fed. Now that factory has difficulty. There's another one in Cape Coast. So I'm saying that there is no shortage. And you attempt to acquire 10,000 hectares of land in Ghana. Trouble. Trouble. All the feudal land I am telling you, and our land tenure system is so bankrupt, and I want to use the word bankrupt, that if you attempt to go for the next 20 years, even in Benz that started in 75 years, somebody came only recently to say, oh, the land belongs to me, after, after over 30 years. So we need, we, and I, I come back, the ABCs, the very fundamental issues we have not tackled, and yet we want somebody to go and, 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 and buy. I, 
What did a Chabon's government do? They acquired the land, they paid the comp they didn't pay the compensation because we had to pay the compensation. But at least they acquired the land. And then the private sector went there. They used their they, sovereign rights. Precisely. To say, we are and government. we have enough laws to do that. And we sit and talk and talk about agriculture, but we need to be bold and courageous. Mm -hmm if we want to change this country. <laughs> Dr. Popo, if you take a look at it, and governments go, government comes, so we're not particularly saying it's a government issue, but no. when, you, when you come to look at the regulations and the laws and the, the, the policy directives, um, well, right now we'll say oil brings us a lot of money, cocoa brings us, a, gold brings us a lot of money. How do we, or do we have the mindset that, look, we want to make sure for this very compound we're going to have well a plantation of this and that and that and no matter how how it is this is the structure of the map this is how how we need to deploy deploy logistics attract people or implement policies to serve as incentives and things like that do, do we have something of the sort that says agriculture should be the next and so we want to do it for just providing what small irrigation facility tractors here and still keeping things small uh, like uh, you said earlier, um, the policy environment for me is good. The drive to do to take advantage of it is what is lacking. And for governments, we respond to demands by society. Well, if, and, you, if, and you leave, if you leave it that is it, nobody will come for it because it's not a lucrative area as yeah, it is. Um, I, 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 I agree, revolutionize it. I agree that sometimes government has to show the direction. Like he quoted a champion, you know, I mean, he referred to that champion regime and what they have done. Sometimes government has to take the direction. And I want to repeat again that sometimes the private sector also have to take the direction and we follow. And we support in whatever way we want. What we need to do, look, one of the challenges that many people referred to at the eve of uh, the 90s was that, I mean, at the, at the dawn of the 90s was that we, there was no stability, no political stability, no consistent, um, uh, what do you call it, economic uh, policy arrangement, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we are able to streamline these ones, then the next thing we will expect, I will expect, is to see pressure on us. You see, nobody, look, open the railway stations, nobody will talk about the economy, nobody will talk about agriculture. You see, government is driven by citizens' pressure all over. They all talk about politics. They are talking about John Mahama, His Excellency. They are talking about Nana Akufuadu. They are talking about Baumie something. So, you know, so, we don't have the, a conscious citizen that is piling on pressure on government to do one thing or the other. We have a civil society that is also a laid back one that responds only when they see a political correctness action taken by a government or something. I want to see a situation where a momentum is developed from the private sector and then a push will be given by government and we say that, look, any time you want to contest an election, these are the priorities. We want to insist that this is what we want. It is also one aspect of it. Another aspect is what he talked about, that a government will just say, look, close eyes to everything. I want agriculture as my priority. Everybody fall in place. That period is over. We are in a liberal regime. We have free thinking well, we, we is doing that he, he, well, he doesn't have a liberal you can't religion. yeah you can't go to you yeah. can't compare the two if you, you can't compel people to invest in agriculture in ghana if you joke by the time you acquire the land and everything government will be the one providing money to do all the things nobody but government is not providing direction then yeah i'm saying that because if, government is wait, waiting on the citizenry or the hmm. the, the mass of uh, private enterprise to lead the way, then there then must means be, that there's a certain disconnect. I'm talking about a critical mass of business yes. that is showing interest and that is having the required drive. You know, in other words, the two pools, the, the pool from the government and the pool from the private sector, must have consistent. They must meet at a certain point, and and then we can move. It's important that 
we, we do something about it. Mm. But it's also important that um, we find reason to do it. Do, do we have some young members involved in agriculture? Yes, we do. Some few of them, eh? A uh, few of them. Mm. But you see, our members are very connected to agriculture because we have a lot of agro-processing companies. And I think that it is also one area that has uh, failed and it's also the reason why industry is also not doing that well, especially in the area of agro-processing. Because the connection between agriculture and industry is so, should be so strong. Unfortunately, uh, every area, every company has this area of concentration. If I'm a manufacturer, I want to concentrate on my manufacturing. I don't have the capital to go into agriculture and produce and supply my factory with their own materials. It's a different kind of business. There are people who are specialized in that. Let them do it. And what, what I would like to see is that when I start up a, my, my, when I start up a factory and I want to produce, I want to get a consistent supply of raw materials. The Polugu tomato factory we had in the north, which was rehabilitated, you know, so at, just uh, take, uh, blue skies. Exactly. Yeah, okay. We don't get enough. Uh, uh, enough you don't get enough materials. Yeah. Surprising. Yeah. Years back. Pineapples. Years but back. I mean, uh, oil yeah. seed like cow cowpea and all those things, we got, we, we've got some of our members, we sent them to Holland, they got good orders, they came, oh, the company, the, the, the uh, buyer even gave them some money to expand their factory and all that. Getting the supplies to process and export became so a makes, challenge. It makes so, the whole process of manufacturing very difficult in the area of agri, agri, yeah, agri, agri business or agro processing. And therefore, there must be conscious effort. By who? And here, on both sides, but I think the lead, the lead role is government. And it's not because we, we don't want private sector to, to play their role, but we think that there are certain fund Because if an investor comes and it's going to take him two years to acquire land, mm. his investment will be gone, well, and he's unsure of, of, of yeah, what, what, what the next five years is going to be because he'll be back down with land litigation and so on and so forth. He can't continue like that. So, well, well, so well, good point you made today. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, um, struggling to see how, uh, for all now the real estate houses we're building, who would want to give his land on the cheap? Uh, that's why I guess we all want uh, a certain drive from whoever, but the argument is it, ha it has to come from the private sector or government. I think government should be leading the way in many respects. Who has to build the roads? Who has to make sure that the transport si station system is good enough so that even if you have to do freight uh, forward system, not only using road, which is also time wasting, etc. You have um, the the good air system, not only for domestic travels, but also for commercial cutting of goods and services. I guess we all need to have a certain perspective about it. But we're bringing to you this very uh, live discussion from the premises, the head office of HFC here at Rage in Accra, and it's just a prelude to a uh, celebration of independence, marking 59 years of getting our nationhood from the United Kingdom. Mm, have we done well or haven't we done well? That's your own sentiment and comment you have to bring us. And it's on the platform 0560 800,000 on WhatsApp and also on Facebook, uh, Join News on TV, which has been linked to our Twitter handle at Join News on TV. We're taking a break. When we come back, we'll be looking at the area of leadership. Do we need leadership or can we blame leadership or is there a vacuum in leadership as a result of which we're not where we are or we're where we are? So that's where we'll be focusing on next. But we're taking a break. We'll be right back. Again, we're bringing to you a live discussion just as uh, a prelude to the whole marking of our 59th independence anniversary. And it's a special edition of the show from the premises of HFC headquarters at Rich here in Accra. And Rich... Uh, is the headquarters of HFC because they bring you a lot more as far as the banking services are concerned and they know all the difficulties you go through and yourself you know that no matter how much you have it's never enough uh, all of us need indeed a lot of uh, interest on our savings uh, on an investment and also 
charges on all our banking transactions. And so what if there's a place that will give you all suitable savings account earnings uh, for you to get a of the interest rates, uh, where also ATM transactions and other bank charges cost you nothing at all. That place is HFC Bank, and they do just that. They offer you more interest rates on your savings account, and it's up to a maximum of at least 15%, zero charges on your ATM uh, transactions with HFC, zero uh, charges on services on specific accounts, and do nothing but only put smiles on your face. So welcome to HFC Bank. Please make sure you sign up to the various accounts. Uh, I have the flyers here. I would want to demonstrate to you. I'm a TV man, and they have the HFC 55 plus accounts. They also have the HFC uh, Premium Savers account. They also have the HFC Susu Plus account. And they also have the HFC Home Safe Plus account. There's one that is not here though, that is the I Do account. And when we say I do, for many of you who want to do events, you want to marry, for example, they have this plush premises here for you to uh, undertake your events, your wedding receptions, etc. just as part of the incentive to entice you to become they are premium loyal customer, HFC, possible together. Now, let's continue our discussions. And uh, we know that we've been doing all the perspective as to what we need to do from independence or should have been doing. Now, we want to focus on leadership. And I have to start with you. Because you've seen it all. You've seen the various governments, whether it's under a revolutionary era, democracy, a shortcut or not, sustained or not. Do we have or have we had a leadership? not seeing the development that we need. Well, Ronan, thank you very much. I think that, uh, uh, let me take it from where we ended. <laughs> we elect governments to provide leadership. And, and, and governments define the context within which all other players participate. So it is for our government to define our development direction, and it is for the private sector or industry to fit into that. You cannot just get up and say, I am here, I want to do this, if it doesn't fit the priorities of the country. Of course you can do it, but then remember you're on your own. So we elect governments to provide leadership. And I think the mistake we often make is that when you when you talk about leadership, everybody's man is a president, so everybody's uptight. You are criticizing the president. I'm, I want to disabuse people's minds. We talk about leadership, and we talk about leadership in terms of those who have been given the right to manage our economy. And I must say that we have not done well at all. Since independence. Since independence. We haven't. Nkrumah was a great leader. And I always say that he was a leader ahead, far ahead of his people. So although he has huge ideas, big ideas, and I, and, and I marvel sometimes what he did within the space of nine years. Really a visionary leader. But he didn't carry the people along with him. And therefore, either through our misunderstanding or whatever, he was removed from office. At that stage, we didn't even have the time to reflect. All we thought about, everything about Nkrumah was bad, destroyed. And since then, we have been experimenting with the life of this country. Every government has come and done something different, all hoping that we will create a vibrant economy. And I must say, they all have brilliant ideas. You, you have every manifesto of every political party in this country they all have good thoughts. So why are we where we are today? And we are here because we just don't implement what we say we want to implement. Because, and I want to emphasize the point I made earlier on, we often don't put our country ahead of our parties or of ourselves. It's about our party, and when it's about party A, I'm a supposed even if it is good for our country. And if it's about party B, even when we know that the agreement is bad for this country, we have to support it. And I think 
where the leadership has failed this country is that we have not been nationalistic enough. We haven't thought about our country. We haven't put the country at the center, at the core of our agenda. Otherwise, why should we have such beautiful manifestos, such beautiful agenda, and still find ourselves, today you drive through Accra, there's nothing beautiful you see, nothing. You can see the, purple, the, the pictures of Accra 20 years from now. Today, everywhere is full of chaos, it's full of filth, it's full of paper, it's full of, it's full of plastic, trash. trash everywhere. And we are in the 21st century. Go to our hospitals. I'm saying that if you have a leader or a leadership with very clear agenda where you want to go, and that leadership is, is determined whether it means losing power or not, is prepared to take the tough decisions that we need in this country and back it with commitment and integrity. Because most of the time, our people rebel against our government because they don't see integrity in the life of our leadership. Well, it's also because it could be possible that uh, our people themselves, uh, we don't have integrity. Yes, but we do have integrity. But you see, if you have a leader, and I heard Professor uh, uh, Ata, uh, Ade, Ade say recently, <laughs> he says, just over the weekend. Yeah, just over the weekend. The fish spoils from the head. When I was when I was chairman of Unilever, everybody knew that by eight o'clock. By 10 to 8, I'm in that factory. So, and every director knows that by 8 o'clock, I probably will call his office. So I don't have to tell him to be there at 8 o'clock. He will be there. And everybody will be there. Not because they are forced to be there, but they know there's a leader who is setting a very clear example that there are, there are things that are accepted and there are things that are not accepted. And if you, if you cross the red line, that there are sanctions against it. You don't manage a country by your own personal standards and agenda. It must be driven by what the country requires. Did we vote since independence to have a country with so much poverty? We didn't vote for that. Nobody in this country, when Nkrumah said we want to build a country in which nobody lacks you know, uh, uh, education, water, health, and yet today, where do we find ourselves? For thousands of people lack. Yes, and this is all what we bargained for. And I am not a political leader, but the political leaders of this country knew what their people wanted. So why have they not given that? Why have they not delivered that? And why are they not accepting responsibility for it? And every day, every night, all we hear is about party A. Said The radio stations, the media, they have joined the bandwagon. Every day, the country is so politicized that all you need to do is to cough. They know which political party you belong to. Mm. We don't build countries like that, and we'll get nowhere. Well, Dr. Popo, would you say that it's because there's no uh, synergy between the political elite groupings? And as a result of that uh, post in Krumah, we have not had that uh, level of harmonization and unity that will would be the center around which the people could also develop their aspirations and then carry those aspirations forward? Well, that's a very good question. Whether leadership is about a pivotal arrangement in which you have some other splinter leaders recoursing to, so in the end, you'll have these ones working because they're the center is working. But let me define leadership in three ways. First, the leader who is political, who has a social contract with the people, either de facto or de jure, elected or he forces himself to take the power. And then a leader who is a corporate leader. This man has his own work. I'm a private man, I establish a corporate entity and I'm managing it. And then a leader who is not political but who is public. If you look at the Public Accounts Committee, most of them are failing. They are leaders, they have problems. They are misappropriating money they can't answer for. 
If you look at the established factories by Nkrumah since the days, they collapse because they don't have leadership. Nothing is working. We are selling them to businesses that we think can provide better leadership, better commitment and efficiency. So we cannot talk about leader just as a political leader. We can talk about a leader um, in terms of who makes things work at any particular point in time, at any entity, public or private. And in Ghana, um, we have failed in most instances for public leadership. Political leadership, we have done well. We have come a long way, but for now, there is consistency of leadership. Political. Yeah, there is consistency. And, 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 and you know that um, you have elected him, you, have, you can question him, he's responsible to you, and if there's something else that you don't like, you vote him out. So you can teach him a lesson, you can teach your leaders a lesson. Your elected but leaders. They have the leeway to do everything they want within the period when you've elected them. And you can question in which, them. In, in which you can't do anything about. And you can question, but you can't do anything about. You can do something about it. You know, it's you, you can do something about it at the end of the period when they've done the distraction. No, you don't wait until that time. You see, there, 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 there are ways by which you can take leadership to tax and make them do something that otherwise they were not thinking about, except that you might not be conscious about them. You might have to force a discussion. You might have to force um, an action, a civil action. And, and you might have to use the law. All these opportunities are there. People don't use them. They only, they think that, especially including the opposition, they think that when there's something and they go to radio and talk, that is it. Within one week, it's dead. There are ways by which you can oversight leadership. You know, I still insist that there must be a conscious civil society. There must be a conscious citizenry that can take leadership to tax. But I'm saying that so far, political leadership, we've been able to get it right. We are still getting the corporates and the public leader wrong. And from where I am, I I, I'm, I'm in charge of divestiture. I'm in charge of supervising the State Enterprises Commission. The State Enterprises Commission gives sign performance contract with all these other uh, public, service organ public service organizations. At the end of the year, many of them perform abysmally. It is because of leadership. Mr. Yamsen just talked about when he was the chief executive. Everybody in Ghana knows about it. His commitment to work, his name is well sounded because of what he used to do. Have to Google. Yeah, and, and you'll know what he achieved. You know, and that's a single person exerting leadership qualities and getting results. We can have many more such in multiples. When you have the base right, it will force the, the top to be right. So it's a concept I think I believe in that when your when your subjects are not properly tuned you can do whatever you like and it will be okay. If they are properly tuned, you can do whatever you like. Mm. Yes, they will question you. They will find a way of bringing you down. They will find a way of getting you to do the right thing. So, so, so it's important that we begin questioning leadership. Leadership not just because I'm a politician, I'm a president, I'm a minister. Leadership also because you have a household that you are managing. Yeah. Your child is not going to school, you don't care. Leadership because you are a church leader and you are doing the wrong things. Yeah. Leadership because you have a business and you are mismanaging it and you are sucking people by heart, you are chopping the money and you don't want anybody to talk about it. Mm. And leadership because you manage a government organization and you cannot do whatever you like with it. You know, cocoa processing, they are crying. Mm -hmm. Why? They have everything. There's cocoa in Ghana. There's a problem with leadership. Everywhere you go, people have problems with leadership and we point at nothing but the presidency. It's wrong. Mm. Yeah. Well, we have to wrap up our discussions on all this, and I'll be bringing the two of you in, but because they have a perspective, and sometimes you are also you have your limitation. For example, you can be speaking on the political <laughs> issue. <laughs> because you go to the office and say, Mateo, send out away. But at the end of the day, uh, the, 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 there's always a saying that the leader is as good as 
his people. Yeah. Okay, so see, no matter all the things we say, we can't delineate <laughs> what, and I, and what the top, yeah. how good the top is from how bad the... And I'm not suggesting that at all. No, 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 no. A leader has a responsibility to select his team. Yeah. The leader is responsible, and I always say but that... But he's not responsible no, to, no, to, no. to determine the behavior of his no, people. No, no, exactly. Because but, but, he, but, but he doesn't be, select, for example, let, a public servant. No, but let be, he doesn't select the normal civil servant. Yeah, but let me come to that. The leader is as successful as the team that he puts together. Now, let me take the public sector. You have the public service and the civil service. They all work up to a certain code of business ethics. It is somebody's duty to ensure that those ethics that are there, are defined, are respected, and if they are not respected, that the sanctions are ruthless. But always know the political leader, is But it? let me come. So, and then the public servant, and if you, then you ask me, the public servant, if you go to the ministry, who's the chief director? Who appoints the chief director? All right. So the chief director, who has responsibility for the ministry, is the, is the administrative head, is appointed politically. All right. If you go to the, 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 the executive, the president appoints his ministers. And I would assume that the president will appoint only ministers who shares his agenda and who will be committed to his agenda and will deliver his agenda. And I will believe in that. And if any minister doesn't deliver, then the, minister, the president will have the courage to say, I'm sorry, you are not you know, delivering my agenda. Get out. But let me make one point because of what the minister said. A business... It's not a country. And I've said, managing a business is not the same as managing a, a, a country. But the principles are the same. The principles of managing a successful business are not different from the principles of managing a successful country. The scale is different. The complexities are different. But the principles are the same. And I'm, I'm saying that the only reason for me that we are here, you have to talk about corporate leadership. Those corporate leaders who misbehave, their, their, their companies collapse. They pay. They pay prices. They pay price for it. But if, if, if our country is not doing well, the, the, whether the leader remains there or not, it's not, le it's not left to, the, to a political campaign. And how many people can be persuaded and in this country where we don't vote by issues, but by political affiliation, then we are missing a very critical ingredient of democracy and leadership. Mm. Do we have, we're wrapping up, so do we have uh, the leadership that will take us forward? Um, I have to start with you, Mr. Chuma Kwabwa. Well, do we have a leadership for which, uh, if let's say, I become old in 15 years, added to my age, and I meet you, added, 15 years added to your age, you say that for all the things that we talked about today, we, we've had a leadership that has carried us uh, from the norm 15 years' time. Do I, th I, think, I think the past has not been that good in terms of leadership. Are you and therefore, hope for the future? Well, there, there, there's hope. There's definitely hope, except that certain things must be done to create that hope. Leadership goes with systems. What systems do we have in place? And in Ghana, I don't think we have problems with systems. Policies, very good ones. Systems, you know, well written and all that. But adherence to the system becomes a challenge because leadership is failing. And I think that is where the challenge is. If we are able to keep to the system and every system goes with rewards and sanctions. If I don't go by the norm, by the system, I must be sanctioned. If I go by it, I must be rewarded. Same at leadership level, at institutional leadership, corporate leadership, and even political leadership. And therefore, if we're able to keep to the system and, and work very well at it, I'm sure we'll create the cream of people that will take us to the next level of, of, of development. And that is very possible, but we need to develop and work towards it. Evelyn, what about you? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I also agree with the fact that leadership is key in moving the economy and businesses forward. Um, the issue is if you are a leader, you should be able to clearly state your your agenda and your 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 objectives and these objectives must be understood by your team and your team should be willing to follow through with it, it. Be a bind. yes so that all of us all of you in that particular organization or country agree on one part and we are all moving to it if you decide to be out of it then you you are taking off coming from where you're coming from just yeah. the, an ordinary citizen who is working in a public service situation um, you think even though there's only one side always since we began in 1992 always following the having the buying of following the vision and so the other side is always not part depending on which political party about leadership yes, and employees about leadership or? that will take us uh, that will take us forward yeah because you see the issue is the leader has a vision and you follow through with it but the only problem is it becomes truncated when the leader is changed and a new one comes in and he also has his own vision okay so our vision should be such that it runs through for us to follow through with it and there's one thing i want to reiterate we, we've said it already but i also want to say that Leadership should also be bound by law, so that the leader, if he doesn't follow certain processes, should conviction. yes, so that he shouldn't be above the law. The the things that we would have used against a particular person should also ag agree with the leader as well, mm. so that leadership would also know that no, I have a law that can deal with me. Okay. Do we have the right leadership? You mentioned three, three levels of, of leadership, the economic, uh, political, corporate. Uh, you know, we're talking about individuals and the way they act, being heads, so managing small entities, etc. cetera. Do, do we have for the next 10, 15 years? Do we have? Do we have that's those sort of leaders? Uh, yeah, we, whether we have the- From cream, the micro the cream, to the macro. The, that, those cream of leadership. We always have. The challenge is, is that the orientation is always wrong. We have them, if there are no, there's no enough supervision, they do the wrong thing. Okay. The same people, if properly tuned, they do the right thing. But let me just make one point, that every time a leader emerges and he does well, we need to have Ghanaians mobilizing behind him. Yeah. If we don't do that, we regret later on. We regretted with Nkrumah when half of us did not mobilize around him. President Mahama, within the space of three years, has built an infrastructure that cannot be compared to any three years development of any time in our history. I will call on Ghanaians to leave politics aside. Let's examine what he has done and let us see how we can support him to extend this commitment and drive to build the nation and create wealth and value for us. Mm, you have to chip that in, right? <laughs> yes. It's an election year. And then, uh, and, and do we have the right leadership? Just uh, yeah, in okay. 30 seconds. I, I think that we should, we should have a consensus that leadership is critical, whether are they at the political level, at the corporate level, at the public level, it's critical okay. to our success. The second point is that we have to have selfless leadership, selfless. Leaders who come to build and not leaders who come to destroy. We, we need leaders who, who are country driven and they have the integrity to back it. Because one of the biggest issues we have in, in this country is corruption. And if I, if I sit here and I look at the next 15 years and I ask myself, am I seeing leaders coming through who abhor corruption to be difficult for me to say yes? Okay. All right. All right. And finally, to the political party, let me give one advice. I know leadership, people are born with leadership qualities, but it can also be nurtured that political parties must begin to nurture quality leaders. They must grow them. Not must grow them, not just because the person is, is, is uh, a patriot of, uh, of the party and he can talk on radio, on television, that it makes him naturally a leader. No. We need to define the kind of leaders that we believe can take us to the next decade and grow those leaders now and not just articulate people who can just mount platforms and talk. We need quality, selfless leadership with integrity. Mm. If we can develop those leaders, we will be going 
we, uh, uh, building a very robust and a very mm. strong country. Uh, he was talking about political leadership. So I, I believe uh, Dr. Rashid Popo will be one of them. Uh, he is uh, the Minister of State uh, responsible for the private sector and the PPPs at the presidency. He's also the Member of Parliament for War Central. An election year, I always need to make sure I mention that for them because uh, his constituents are watching. They always watch Joy News. And also, uh, Ishmael Yamsen, former chairman of Unilever, uh, has uh, uh, still, still uh, a chairman of Unilever. Unilever, who used to work there, became chairman, has been chairman of many boards, still chairman of many boards around the country, but also founding uh, member of the founder of Ishmo Yamsin and Associates. I've talked with his son on this very channel, Michael, a couple of times as well. And Evelyn uh, Nyako is um, an officer, principal investment advisory officer at the Investor Services Division of the GIPC. I hope I was, I was yeah. politically correct. Yes. <laughs> And then also Seth Chum Akwabwa is the Chief Executive Officer for the Association of Ghana Industries. Uh, all of you have enjoyed my conversation. It's been a long one, but I hope that that will set the tone for us to have a certain mindset about what we need to be discussing in our homes, on the various platforms that are made available, Ketsi, the current democratic dispensation that we tend to enjoy, to give us a better perspective as we look forward to the next 10 to 20 years after celebrating 59 years of nationhood. Well, that'll be it from the ground here, HFC grounds, where we'll be also be speaking to uh, some of the managers and they'll give us a lot more perspective about some of their products and services. So do stay on. You're still watching the AM show live on this very channel.